There. Can you hear me? Are you muted? You are muted. You are very loud. I'm, I am turning my volume down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like I'm loud compared to anything else because there's nothing else here. There's just us. <clears throat> Is that working? Okay. Yes. I just need to figure out where the volume was. <laughs> um, hey, Pamela. It's been Hi. It's been a week. It has. And last time we saw our heroes, I was in the YouTube studio in Los Angeles. And I was in the exact <laughs> same place. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now I am recovering from a week spent filming from early morning until uh, evening. And uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty ruined at this point. But you had fun. Oh, we had super fun. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was really, really good fun. We, uh, we had a chance to interview probably twelve different people over the course of the of the week. We interviewed Mike Brown from you know Pluto Killer, Mike yeah, Brown yeah. from Caltech, Heather Knutson from Caltech, um, Mark Miller. Uh, oh, and one that you'd be a little jealous. Uh, we got to inter interview Andrea Gez from UCLA. Which I know she's one of your one of your heroes. So. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as heroes, but she's someone who I totally admire. Hero is like the next step up. Back. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, anyway, just hearing your stories about about how she uncovered the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way, yeah. and 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 literally, that's just all she thinks about is just that dense, just that region, just around the supermassive black hole. And uh, it was really neat to talk to her and, and uh, just a great person to interview. Yeah, uh, of sure course, we got a chance to talk to um, Dr. Thad Zabo and Ian O'Neill, and, and that was great. And, uh, and then we got a chance to do a live episode of the Weekly Space Hangout right, on, right in the studio. And, we, of course, we did a live episode of Astronomy Cast last week right from the yep. studio. So, yes, it was great. And, uh, you know, again, a big thank you to everyone at YouTube for letting us use their facility for the last week. It was, uh, it was a real treat to, uh, to see how grown-ups make videos. And, and it was an opportunity to learn that you are actually just pink, and it's not the fact that there's a blue wall behind you. Even mm -hmm. while lit, you were slightly pink. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I run a little pink. It's, it's okay. Uh, um, uh, but I do have a blue wall. Uh, <laughs> so, um, right, so if you've never seen this before, what we are doing is a live episode of Astronomy Cast. We're going to be doing episode 321, uh, which is on solar flares. And we'll take about 30 minutes to do this episode, and then we will stick around for another half hour and answer your questions about space and astronomy. So uh, regarding answering your questions about space and astronomy, there's a few places you can do that. One is you can do that from the YouTube page. So if you're watching this over on YouTube, you can post some questions there. You can also post some questions on um, on the event page for this, for, for this on Google+. Uh, and the last place you can do this is over on... Oh, I should post this on Universe Today. Okay, I'll do that in a second. Um, and the last place you can do this is on... Uh, well, so there's a new method that Google+, Plus has. So if you're watching this on my stream, then you can post your questions there, and I will try, try to, uh, to spot them. But really, YouTube is the best place, and your efforts can work to single-handedly improve the quality of contents over of comments over on YouTube. Well, the uh, the whole new Google Plus integration of comments has uh, is going quite hilariously. So I don't know. Have you seen the the no. outrage, the pouring of outrage? So they've switched all the YouTube comments over to Google Plus comments. Right. Now. So I knew that. And. People are. Wait, did that retroactively work too? Uh, well, I don't think so. So it kept all the okay. old comments. Uh, but boy, are people mad! I'm not mad. I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And in fact, the the uh, because and and a lot of not a lot of our viewers really complain because our viewers are also used to Google Plus and they've been they've been working and with that for. They're not trolls. <laughs> and they're not trolls. Yeah. And so you look at the at the complaints of the people on the post where Google announces that they're switching these comments over and is just the worst vile comments you can imagine. Like, you need a shower after you read this stuff. And so you're like, uh, the irony is lost on them. So anyway, I think it was, uh, I think it was, it's a good move. It's a little rough around the edges so far, so it's, it's been really hard to find where the new comments are showing up because you got to... They, they show up as notifications yeah. in Google+, and it's a little still not working very well, so... But overall, it's the, it's absolutely the right direction. They just need to to smooth out all the bugs. So turn on all the push notifications on your phone, and everything will just go to your phone. Is what I've learned. Uh, you'll drive up your data consumption, but 
at least wow. you won't miss anything. Yikes. Um, I forgot to do one thing. I apologize. <laughs> and suddenly mad typing commences. Uh, done. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. So you ready to go? I, I think so. Okay. Anything to announce this week? I will be in Indonesia next week. <laughs> but that's not relevant because this will go live while I'm there. So. Right, but that means that we're going to record something uh, later Randomly this... Randomly this week. Yeah, okay. Probably Wednesday. Okay. Uh, thank you for the notice. I, I will give you better notice once I've looked harder at my calendar. I'm simply realizing tomor tomorrow is impossible. Yeah, just as long as it's before, after 11 Okay. Um, okay. Well, then let's and get rolling. And welcome to the sausage being made. Yes. Yes, you can see how this... You actually get to see us negotiating recording times. <laughs> uh, okay, well, I'm going to click record. Okay, I'm, I'm clicking record... I'm waiting for my computer to do something. It's thinking. Hold on, I had fail. Wah, wah. Yeah. Okay, now it's going. Now it's happy. Okay, mine is still still recording. So. <laughs> Sorry, Preston. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode three twenty one. Solar flares. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Good. I um, just returned back from a week of recording uh, video down at the YouTube LA studios. And uh, so we've got tons of good stuff, uh, and that'll all be appearing in the YouTube feed and on Universe Today over the next couple of months, probably. And, and you got to experience what it's like to record in some place that is not only warm, because I know we both freeze to death in our studios, but yeah. also had like all the bells and whistles, which is kind yeah, of awesome. Yeah, it, it was great. It was just amazing to be able to use all of this all this great gear, cameras, lighting equipment. Um, yeah, it was great. And I really I really appreciated their assistance as well when we didn't know what we were doing, which was most of the time. <laughs> so, so hopefully this will allow us to provide more professional uh, recording type stuff in the future. It's a goal. Uh, it's, it's a goal. Um, just as a reminder to everyone that we record Astronomy Cast every Monday uh, at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, as a live Google Plus Hangout on air. And you can find that video in a bunch of places. Over on Universe Today we post it, uh, on Google Plus, on YouTube, on CosmoQuest. So if you want to watch us live and then interact and ask us questions, uh, you can do that every week, Monday, except for next week when we'll be recording a different time. But normally, every Monday at, uh, at noon. All right, let's get rocking with the, with the episode. So sometimes the sun is quiet. And other times, the sun gets downright unruly. During the peak of its 11-year cycle, the surface of the sun is littered with darker sunspots, and it's from these sunspots that the sun generates massive solar flares, which can spew radiation and material in our direction. What causes these flares, and how worried should we be about them in our modern age of fragile technology? Um, so, yeah, let's talk about solar flares. And, and 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 you have could not have timed the, your selection of this episode any better because we are just experiencing a gigantic sunspot cluster AR eighteen ninety, and it has f been firing off uh, material in our direction. It is flare happy, and flare. this means if if you have any flights upcoming, make sure you figure out which side of the aircraft is going to be the north side of the aircraft if you're flying after dark, because these aurora are absolutely amazing to watch from an aircraft, and uh, you couldn't get a better time to see them. Yeah, absolutely. It's a uh, it's an absolute treat to, especially because because a lot of like if you're gonna fly from say New York to Europe, you're gonna go Great Circle route. You're gonna go past Greenland, and you're gonna get a view. So absolutely, if you're you know if you're going that way, try and take the left side of the aircraft. Chicago to Beijing, right side of the aircraft. Yeah, yeah, so figure that out. So, okay, so let's talk about solar flares then. So so what is the underlying, I guess, you know, what is the, the series of processes that lead up to us seeing a solar flare? 
it, it's basically a fairly simplistic process to try and explain and extremely complicated to mathematically model. What's happening is as our sun is working on turning its magnetic fields inside out, as it's working to make its north magnetic pole, its south magnetic pole, or its south, its north, uh, however you want to look at it, it reaches this, this phase at what we call is solar maximum. And during solar maximum, a bunch of the magnetic field lines, the lines of force along which particles flow, uh, end up forming helixes that pop out through the surface of the sun. And where they pop out, we see these darker regions, these sunspots or solar complex, sunspot complexes. And these field lines, uh, they contain vast amounts of energy. And sometimes these field lines realize that, hey, we'll be at a much lower energy if we break the top part of our coronal loop, this loop of uh, helixed magnetic lines that come out the surface of the sun and basically form giant arches. If we break off the top section, set it free, and reconnect closer to the surface of the sun. During these magnetic field line reconnection processes, all of that energy that was trapped in that magnetic field, that tube of plasma, uh, suddenly gets released. It becomes kinetic energy, it becomes thermal energy, and all of that goes firing off. And uh, in some cases, it gets fired off straight at us. You know what's the, one of the best experiments that you can do to sort of show this process? Is take spaghetti and bend it and break it and I, I forget the exact physics that, are, that make this happen, but you will always get a chunk of spaghetti flying off. Stress and strain. Yeah, and that you'll, it never just breaks. It no. always fires off a chunk of spaghetti out, you know, and you'll get like one or two pieces that will head off in one direction just because of the, I don't know, the physics involved, the forces and the stresses and stuff. So you can imagine, you know, you can fire chunks of spaghetti at your friends with, uh, and you say, oh, I'm just making solar flares. It's just a science experiment. <laughs> Um, right, so you get this, you get these these disconnections and reconnections, and then you get this this release of of energy. And so, like, what kind, like, on what order? Well, like how much energy are we dealing with here? Um, this is one of those things that that when I started looking up the energies, it it was really kind of mind numbingly large. Uh, I'm in the process of pulling up the numbers, so if you see me looking in strange directions, it's because I want to get this right. So it's the equivalent of millions of 100 megaton hydrogen bombs exploding all at once. It's a little less than 10% of the sun's solar output per second. Uh, so when you start thinking about that, that's a pretty huge number. That that's like Earth destruction number. But luckily we're far away. Yeah, yeah. Ten percent of the sun's entire output for a second is released in one little spot. And and when this energy is released, it fires off protons, electrons, basically ionized particles, uh, things that have charge. And this is where it gets interesting because a charge in motion generates its own magnetic field. And those charges in motion end up hitting our own Earth's magnetic field. So how long does this process take? Like, you know, say you've got these, these magnetic field lines are starting to twist up and then you get that, that event. How long does that whole process take and, and sort of, but then to sort of get to the Earth? Well, it's it's only a few seconds for the the whole uh, arch, the the loop of uh, twisted magnetic field lines to break and reconnect. Um, but then the light travels towards us so that we can see this happening. That travels at us, well, at the speed of light. So about eight minutes later, we see what has happened. Uh, some of the satellites that are closer to the sun than us will see it first, but we still have to wait for their information to get to us at the speed of light. So we're not going to find out about this in anything less than a little over eight minutes. But then we have to wait for the particles themselves to get to us. And the particles, luckily, are not traveling at the speed of light. Uh, in some cases, they're traveling faster than others, but in general, you're looking at several hours. Now, where it gets a little bit squirrely is um, our best indication that, oh, oh dear, the Earth is about to get hit comes from a set of geostationary satellites. These are the GOES satellites, which, which highly amuse me uh, with their naming scheme. They're the geostationary operational environmental satellites. They're constantly watching 
both down at the Earth to measure weather, and before they get launched, they're named letters. So goes A, goes B, goes G. Uh, last year they launched goes P, which is my most favoritely named satellite. Um, but once they're giggle. on orbit, yeah, yeah, you have to giggle at that yeah. one. Um, but once they're on orbit, they get renamed with numbers. Uh, so we've we've had goes one, goes two, goes three, orbiting the Earth. And these satellites being up at geostationary orbit, um, they're significantly higher up than the space station, than the space shuttle, or was the space shuttle, now Soyuz. Um, and they detect the particles coming towards the Earth uh, a little bit sooner because they're further out. And they can provide the astronauts all of about 15 minutes warning that they need to seek shelter. Something really bad is coming. Now, why would the astronauts need to seek shelter? Well, these high-energy particles, uh, they can cause severe damage when they start hitting your molecules. This is a form of radiation. This is actually one of the major reasons that we're worried about keeping our astronauts safe if they go on a mission out to Mars. Here on the surface of the Earth, we're well inside the Earth's magnetic field. We have a big atmosphere above us. All of these different things work to either redirect the streaming particles or to uh, protect us from the high energy photons that they release. Um, we're safe on the surface. The astronauts are up above a lot of the protection and um, they can get zapped in ways that could increase the probability of cancer and otherwise harm their DNA. Now is this an issue for the astronauts on board the International Space Station? Because it, it orbits much lower, right? And it's protected by our magnetosphere. It's protected by our magnet by our ming there. Sorry, Preston. It's protected by our magnetosphere, but it's not protected by our atmosphere. So if you have X-ray photons, those are quite happy to go through things like oh fiberglass. Um, so they'll get stopped by metal shielding. They'll get stopped by other things, but the highest energy photons that get released. Those are going straight for the astronauts through the outer shell of the space station in some areas. There are regions that they can go into that are safer, and that's where they go when there's really bad events. But the, but the real risk is for the folks who, who would leave the Earth's orbit and go to the moon or Mars or things like that, right? I mean, they're really exposed. Right. So, so it's the, the space between here and Mars that is the most dangerous. If you're on the moon, you can go under the surface. If you're on Mars, you can go under the surface. You always have some hole in the ground that you can climb into if you need it. Uh, between here and Mars, you, you want to have as lightweight a spacecraft as possible, which means uh, you're probably not going to have a big lead shield all around you, and you're probably not going to have a big water layer between you and the outside of your spacecraft. All of these extremely heavy things can help to protect you from the radiation, but they weigh too much to support taking them all the way to Mars. Yeah, and I know that the uh, the astronauts, when the when the astronauts went to the moon, they actually were really fortunate that they avoided some of these major flares. They were there when it was quiet, but before and after, there was some pretty bad flares. Yeah, there there was uh, at least one Apollo mission where it was just a couple weeks before and a couple weeks after there were some big X-class flares that could have seriously harmed the lives of the astronauts. Um, and at that point, we didn't necessarily have uh, all of the GOES satellites giving us early warnings. Yeah, this is a really new development, is that we have this monitoring system so that we can see these flares on the sun and then take action, like I guess you see the radiation, and then take action before the particles arrive. You've got this, this gap, right? And, and, and in all honesty, GOES wouldn't have, happened, wouldn't have helped with the Apollo missions because geostationary is inside of the moon's orbit, but we also have things like Solar Dynamic Orbiter, we have uh, a whole series of uh, satellites out there monitoring the sun, the stereo missions, uh, the numbers just go on and on. Yeah, and the the worse the flare, the less time you have, right, because there's more energy boosting the particles out. Well, it, it's a combination of Yes, there, there's more energy, how it's released, but you can spread that energy over a larger area or you can concentrate it in a smaller area. Uh, so it, when you use words like big, that's not 
the clearest word because you can have this big giant thing but the flux over any small area is is much less um, so so when we start trying to figure out um, is this a big flare is this a small flare what we actually look at is the flux over set region as measured by the GOES satellites at the distance of well geostationary orbit above the earth well they have a method for classifying flares right they have a actual like was it M X different right different right yeah. and and this ends up being so they they make estimates of how strong they think the different flares are going to be based on what they see and then they classify the flare finally by how strong it is when the energy hits the Earth's atmosphere um, so this is where you start looking at uh, watts per square meter uh, they look at it in the 100 to 800 picometer wavelength of the light that's coming and it, it's actually measured by satellites in geostationary orbit of the Earth so they do make estimates based on what they see but the final measurement comes from the flux that's hitting at geostationary orbit and so what is the the I guess the measurement system like we have like with uh, earthquakes right you've got the uh, you know, well, I guess before it was the Richter scale as a new scale, um, but you know, tornado scales, you've got hurricane scales. Right. Uh, so, so, so just like with the Richter scale, and just like with the magnitude system we use with our eyes, this this is a logarithmic scale. Um, a is the the wussiest. It gives off uh, ten to the minus seven watts per square meter. Uh, so, if you imagine um, a millionth, basically, of a Christmas one watt Christmas tree light. Um, or I guess a ten millionth of of a Christmas tree light. Um, that's how much light you have covering a square meter. Then ten to the minus seven to ten to the minus six. Uh, that's a B class flare. Um, and then the X class flares are ones that are ten to the minus four watts per square meter. So. The amazing thing is these things aren't even giving off as much light as your faintest Christmas tree light with its energy spread out over an entire square meter. But when you start looking at the size of the Earth's atmosphere, there's a whole lot of area to be collecting all of that wattage. And it adds up and all of those moving particles they they create uh, changes in our Earth's magnetic field, and uh, here's where it it starts to sound a little bit like turtles all the way down. So you have moving particles coming from the sun. Moving particles generate magnetic fields. The magnetic fields from these particles uh, cause variations in the Earth's magnetic field. When the Earth's magnetic field varies, you end up uh, creating well, in this case, current, and that current just happens to be in places like, oh, with the power grid on the planet Earth. Wires are very good at uh, carrying current that's generated by changing magnetic fields. So what's the most powerful flares that are sort of possible? Um, the, the most powerful one that, that's been measured so far is one that occurred, uh, it's called the Carrington Flare, and it, it occurred in the 1800s. In fact, it occurred on September 1st, 1859. And there's a well-to-do uh, scientist, uh, a gentleman scholar, you might say, 33-year-old uh, Richard Carrington. And he was, at the time, England's foremost solar astronomer. And he got up in the morning, and he was happily making his daily measurements. And there's this amazing sunspot cluster that um, well, if, if you look at the images, uh, science.nasa.gov has them posted, um, and they're stored by the Royal Astronomical Society. Um, it looks more like a sea serpent or a whole bunch of slugs come together uh, than like your classic single or double sunspot. It's, it's this amazing system. And at 11.18 in the morning, uh, he saw where the sunspot that he was sketching was suddenly flashed out with white light. And that is significant because the majority of the energy given off in solar flares isn't in white light. It's in much higher wavelengths of light that aren't visible to the eye. Uh, he saw a white light flare in his projection of the sun. And he went to go get a friend to witness it with him so that it wasn't a lone account. 
And just five minutes later, when he returned with someone, it was already starting to fade away. So this, this amazing flare that was visible in white light, uh, the next day created aurora borealis and aurora australis that reached all the way down to places like Jamaica and Cuba, places that normally never get to see this. Um, so this was the biggest flare that anyone has ever seen. And what's kind of remarkable is if you take Arctic ice cores or Antarctic ice cores, uh, you start to see uh, the history of solar flares recorded in the ice. And this is a once in 500 years event. Uh, no other flare in the 160 some odd years of visual observations or in the 500 years that we can measure through the ice has compared to this. And in fact, uh, it's more than twice as powerful as the next brightest flare. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know the, the one that was fairly recent, we had one a couple of years ago, and it was like an X28 flare. Right. And that that was the one that took out the the power grid. That yeah, and I I've heard that that one in the in the in the 1850s was like an X40. Right. So so the one that you're talking about is the March 1989 geomagnetic storm. Um, so it it makes us old that that seems like just a few years ago. Yeah. Well, I, but I I mean yeah I remember it happening. Right. We had a big problem in Canada. We had this. Oh, I'm trying to remember. It's referred happened. to as the Quebec blackout. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this was when we learned for the first time, really, and and we knew from the 1859 event because it actually uh, caused telegraph wires to set paper on fire, and they disconnected all of the batteries from the telegraphs, and they were still able to to send messages through the wires. Um, but this was the first modern history one where everyone was relying on electricity and this happened. So the problem was is the power grid in Quebec was running at pretty high capacity. And you can only send so much electricity through the wires before they start to do things like melt, like change length, uh, stretch under their own. Um, so so as, as they stretch, as you heat them up, uh, they'll eventually even just break. And so in this case, they overpowered the Quebec power grid and uh, sort of took out power to a large chunk of the Northeast Corridor. And so this is, I think, the big issue. I mean, when you think about these horrible blasts of radiation coming from the sun and you wonder, like, are we going to get irradiated? The answer is no, thanks to our atmosphere, but it's this impact on our technology that's the problem. Right. And, and you have to worry about what happens if this sort of uh, sudden blackout happens and it's winter and there's people relying on electronic heat. We, we learned during the more recent 2003 blackout, which was caused by tree limb on wire and a faulty alarm going off, that um, if you knock out the power for the Northeast, Canada and the United States, it can take as long as two days to get that power back on. Well, in the summer, you just sweat a lot. But in the winter, that can become deadly because not everyone has fireplaces anymore. And, yeah, Quebec uh, is not a nice place in the no. winter time without power. Right. And, and so we have to really start worrying about northern China, about northern Russia, about Scandinavia, Iceland, and all through Canada, Alaska, and the northern United States. And it's in these northern extremes where the winter is so much worse that um, our power grid is the most fragile. But, I mean, it's more than that. I mean, we've got these communi telecommunication systems. We've got communication satellites. We've right. all got these computers that sit in our pockets now. And, I mean, and these X-class flares can take out a satellite now and then if they're particularly strong. All of that X-ray energy, um, yeah, that, that can knock out sensors. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the big risk. Now, our sun is a, what is it, a... a you know, a minor dwarf star, is it a G dwarf star? It's, it, a, it's a G star, yeah, yeah. main sequence, it's, everyday star. But but the solar flares change with the different kinds of stars, and we've talked about like red red dwarf stars, they have totally right. different kinds of flares, right? Right, and and in, fla in fact, depending on what phase a star is in, um, they're all generally called uh, flare stars, uh, but they have different subclasses. And uh, one of the nastiest stars for a prolonged period is those red dwarfs when they're quite young 
I'll go through a couple billion years of giving off massive blasts of x-rays such that any planet that was in what would otherwise be known as their habitable zone uh, would simply get irradiated into oblivion. And that's long enough that your planet is formed, mm -hmm. is sitting there, and um, any life on it gets destroyed before uh, the system really settles into existence. And then what about some of the like the bigger stars, like the big, you know, the big so Eta Carina, <laughs> things like that, right? Well, so so Eta Carina, it's it's not so much a flare star as it has it's undergone uh, various nova over. Well, it underwent one big uh, brightening in the 1800s. Uh, but we have other things like UV SETI stars. The, these are stars that when you watch them, um, they give off these sudden brightening moments that are quite brief. And we believe that these are flares just like our sun experiences. Uh, we're able to observe sunspots on other stars. Uh, we have no reason to believe that these parallel brightenings aren't a parallel event caused by flares. So it's neat to see that the physics that applies to our sun applies at different scales and other types of stars all across our universe. So, you know, we've done a whole show on uh, on the Aurora Borealis and Aurora Australia. So, you know, if you want to go back and get more information about how to see the Northern Lights and, and what the mechanism that's going on there. But just sort of as a, just a refresher, if people want to be able to see the Northern Lights thanks to these flares, and especially now that we're in this right. solar maximum time, so this is your chance. So what should people do to sort of get up to speed on what's going on? And it's great new technology now. Well, the, the best thing you can do is keep an eye out on solarweather.com, or spaceweather.com, rather. Uh, that website will always uh, keep you up to date on where the uh, best auroras are likely to happen. Uh, and if you find out you're in a region where there's a likelihood of seeing aurora, get out of the city lights. Find some place that doesn't have that much light pollution, or make sure the light pollution is on the southern horizon. And then look north and watch for streaks, for curtains, for mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of amazing glowing uh, movement along the horizon and sometimes all the way up to the zenith. It's really beautiful to watch. Yeah, I mean, even since we've been recording this show, the, the technology for tracking them and predicting them has gotten a lot better, and that information has even really gotten disseminated out through the Internet. So there's, I don't know, there's apps you can use, and maybe people can make some recommendations of, of what they've used, but there's apps you can use that will, that will give you predictions, you know, when it's time to go see a some aurora so it's so it's pretty amazing now what's what's possible and if and so if you if you live anywhere north of i don't know like what chicago even more south than that yeah you, yeah i mean you stand a chance of being able to see one especially during this this solar maximum the the best shot is always in scandinavia and in alaska but but really uh, anyone from about boston london northward uh, you're probably good to go um, but this is where I'd say also go back and listen to our show on coronal mass ejections because solar flares do have a bigger, badder brother. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, good. Okay. Well, I, was there anything else you wanted to bring up this week? No, I think that's about it. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. All right. And we save. And we save. And if any of you all have questions, now is the time to leave them, preferably on YouTube, because that's the best place to find them. This is where I try and figure out who is texting me. I heard that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to start with some YouTube questions here. Okay. Let's see. Uh, so Paul Polygona Nine asks, "What would happen if the sun stopped turning? What uh, impact would that have on solar flares? It would, st it would stop them, wouldn't it? It it wouldn't stop them immediately because the outside of the sun and the inside of the sun don't rotate at the same rate. Um, but if you stopped the sun all the way through the center, so there was zero rotation." Um, I'd love to know where you put the angular momentum, but ignoring that, yeah, it would stop the solar magnetic field and stop flares and stop the solar cycle and just stop. Yeah, because, I mean, a lot of that's just all about differential, ro different amounts of rotation, right, and the well, interactions. And, 
any rotation is going to generate a magnetic field if you have charged particles. Right, and so if it all just stops and just... I mean, you could probably get small localized stuff, but you wouldn't get these these just these big reconnections. That's right. that's pretty interesting. Well, and and what's kind of neat to think about is our moon has frozen in place magnetic fields where uh, particles got aligned in rocks from when there was more molten rock and more uh, magnetism on the moon. So there there's residual magnetic fields. Mars has some residual fields as well. Um, but because the sun's a plasma, it's not going to have any residual fields the way the moon and Mars do. Uh, Joseph Romero says this is his first time watching us live after listening to us for six years. So, Welcome. Welcome, Joseph. Um, let's see, what else we got now? Uh, and Richard Drum is watching us live. Hi, Richard. How awesome is that? Richard uh, helps us out all the time for all kinds of things, but specifically he's been extracting out the audio and editing some of our some of our live stuff and putting it into the Astronomy 365 feed. Yeah. So. And he's the one who hooked me on meteorite collecting, so it's his fault. Yes. Um, yeah, and Richard says that this show will also be available as a 365 Days of Astronomy podcast yeah. on Monday the 18th. So a lot of the stuff that we do goes out that feed as well. So the, yeah. the Weekly Space Hangout is out there, the Learning Space, I think. Yep, yeah. everything we do goes out that way. Yeah. Um, so check out 365 Days of Astronomy and uh, get many different fixes, many different voices uh, for your astronomy addiction. Uh, um, Tommy Dog on YouTube asks, "What effect is the solar flare Class X that happened yesterday going to have on us?" Beautiful Aurora. We're Beautiful. already we're already starting to get photos coming back. Yeah. Uh, okay, Mike Hunt asks, "I have a question for anyone in the chat, and I guess, but I'm going to fire this question to you, Pamela." Um, <laughs> I keep hearing that the galaxies are moving away from each other, and the space between is expanding. How come we're going to collide with the Andromeda galaxy? Oh, uh, that that one's actually... People like to confuse other people by explaining this poorly. If you have galaxies that are gravitationally bound together, they're going to continue to interact like normal. If you have a group of gravitationally bound galaxies here and one lone galaxy over here, this one lone not gravitationally attached one, it's going to get carried away by the expansion of the universe. Uh, so since we're gravitationally bound with Andromeda and other local group galaxies, Triangulum, um, we get to stay bound together and eventually collide. Uh, but when we look out, most of the galaxies we see aren't attached to us. So we see them streaming away with the expansion of the universe. Could you imagine there's some galaxy that's like the or two galaxies that are at the perfect distance from each other where the expansion is carrying them away and the gravity is pulling them together and they just remain perfectly there, the same distance apart? Well, it, it's not never quite in balance because everything has intrinsic motion. Um, but we do see examples of, of flows where things... Uh, the, the motion is uh, harder to tell and you do see these balancing points getting past one direction or the other. I actually did an episode of the explainers, you know, we've, I've been running on, on YouTube, and one is, someone asked me this question, is everything in the universe expanding? And uh, so I, I go into that. Short answer, no. Longer answer, maybe, thanks to the big rip. Um, okay, let's see. Um. Nope, nothing else there. Eric Williams says, this chat is broken, sorry. Although he just chatted. Um, that doesn't... Silamoran Cecile asks, is this solar maximum a bit different from what you might expect from a solar maximum? Has this period been longer than usual this time? I, so we don't know when it's going to end yet. We have to look for the locations of the sunspots to change, and that will tell us how things are going. Um, but this solar maximum has been much wussier, for lack of a better word, much less powerful than past solar maxima, and it took much longer to come out of solar minima than expected. Um, so the sun is definitely quieter this cycle. It had originally been predict predicted that it was going to be much more active, and so far that just hasn't happened, and we should be coming out of solar maximum at this point. So take that, 2012 <laughs> conspiracy theorists. 
this is a late and lame solar maximum. Is true. And we won't and we won't know how lame until it completely wraps up. But yeah. so far, but that's weird because we were expecting this was going to be one of the more powerful ones. That that right, was the prediction. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it just didn't happen that way. Um, <laughs> Graham Sticking says that are, are solar flares what our stars wore in the 1970s? Yes. Yes, yes, that's exactly what they wore, solar flares. Um, uh, okay, I got that question. That's over on the Astronomy Cast event. Uh, now I'm going to go to, let's see, I'm going to go to the Google Plus event. Uh, okay, so this is a good question. Hugo Burnham asks, do all other observed stars that have flares also have a min-max cycle like the Sun? Presumably not over 11 years, but at other frequencies. We have observed stars to have solar cycles that are at different durations. Um, I, I can't say off the bat that, yes, every single flare star has been identified to have a solar cycle. Um, I don't know. But I do know that there are many stars that have been observed to have stellar cycles of durations other than the duration observed in the sun. Uh, <laughs> this is great. Uh, so Hugo Burnham says, so a manned future Mars mission would have to launch just as a solar minimum is about to start. And I was sort of talking about the solar minimum. That would yeah, be the best time. It, it would, but unfortunately, things like coronal mass ejections, which, as I said, are the bigger, badder brother to solar flares, they can occur at any time. And it doesn't have to be solar maximum to see them. They, they can arise without solar activity, without sunspots. They can just manifest and fling deadly radiation out from the sun's surface. And Hugo's eight-year-old friend just asked, couldn't they just go at night? <laughs> Sadly, uh, there's no night in outer space. There's only day. Um, and Andrew Planet is wondering where the splash screen term that I mentioned comes from. I don't know, we've been using that on the internet. We used to call that the opening page of the, yeah. the website was the, was your splash screen. And then right. I don't know where that term comes from. Maybe someone can dig that up for us. All right, I'm going to come back around looking. Uh, Susan Murph uh, asks, uh, does the flare have any effect on how many sun dogs we're seeing? We've seen a lot this week. I, I think that those depend more on atmospheric effects, and we're starting to get lots more ice crystals. But let me double check that. Um, so sun dogs are, are where you see um, rings going around the sun that often have uh, a set angle away from the sun, what look like secondary bright spots, secondary suns. Um, I saw a great one in Los Angeles. Actually, there was like it was like little rainbows, and there was rainbows on both sides of the sun. When normally you see rainbows on the opposite side of the sky from the sun, but in this case, I could see these two little rainbows on yeah. either side of the sun. Yeah, they're they're consistently 22 degrees away yeah. from the sun. So if you hold your fists up at arm's length uh, together, that will get you how far away from the sun the sun dogs are, and they're due strictly to ice in the atmosphere. Um, I don't know about where where Susie is, but where I am, we're starting to hit the, oh my gosh, it's well below freezing outside time of year, and the scarf while recording in unheated attic. Um, and once you start getting ice crystals in the atmosphere, you're going to start getting sun dogs around the sun. Yeah, you're, you're not going to get sun dogs from solar flares, though. You're just going to, I mean, it's the regular yeah. output of the sun. It's all about the atmosphere. It's all about yeah. our, our atmosphere. It has nothing to do with the sun. Right. Um, would you be able to, but, but Susie also asked, could I see the solar flares down in Georgia, where she's located? Um, check spaceweather.com. Yeah. It's, these solar flares are big enough that they are going to go further south than normal. Uh, I remember, I think it was 2003, 2004, we had a, a few solar flares that made it as far south as Atlanta. Um, I know Baltimore saw them, uh, so look at space weather and see what the predictions are. Yeah. Um, do the poles change during the solar maximum? I guess the, the poles of the sun. 
I, so they, they change during the entire process. So at, at solar maximum is, is when the poles are most muddied, and then when they're quiet, they're nicely aligned one way or the other. Uh, Joseph Romero says, I've seen something like that around the moon. And that's the exact same thing. That yeah. It's that same process. It's amazing when you think about it, right, that you've got these crystals in the atmosphere, and they're exactly the right shape. It's that... the same thing as raindrops creating a rainbow. Uh, so the exact same physics creates the sun dogs that creates rainbows. Yeah, and so you're seeing the the because the crystals have angles on them that are 22 degrees. You're well, seeing it's, no, it's because the light refracting through the crystals gets bent 22 degrees. Right, right. Sorry, yeah, the light gets refracted exactly 22 degrees, and so so the light could be going all over the sky, but you're seeing all the stuff that's getting refracted in your direction. And, and so someone 20 feet away from you will see the exact same thing. Someone two miles from you with the same atmospheric con conditions will see the same thing. From different it's, crystals. It's, it, yeah, it's, yeah, it's the light radiating out just gets bent back to you at that 22 degree. Yeah, totally. Um, cool. Uh, yeah, so... So I think that's all the questions that I've got here. Um, so what's coming up next on the uh, on the old CosmoQuest uh, info train? Uh, so I think most likely it's going to be us sometime on Wednesday talking about Soho, and then after us at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, midnight-ish. Am I doing that right? Uh, yeah, so midnight, London. Time. Um then uh, it's going to be Learning Space, hosted by Nicole Gallucci and Georgia Basie. Do you know what the topic is this week? No, no. but if you have the CosmoQuest newsletter, it'll say in the newsletter. Right, yeah, she sends an email out. Yeah. Uh, and then Friday's the Weekly Space Hangout, and then Sunday's the Virtual Star Party, and I'll yeah. be back after not being around for a couple of weeks. So, uh, awesome. Uh, well, thank you very much, Pamela, as always. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and uh, we will see you all here uh, next week. Thank you.